but there is also, it seems, archaeological evidence uh, provided by the ruin fields of Samara. This has been studied in detail, and such efforts remain ongoing. Um, they include at least one study by Derek Kennett of the settlement patterns of the Turkish record file. Further attention might be given as well to the long description by Tabari, uh, the great Baghdadi historian of the activity of the Turkish rank and file at a particular point. He recounts in close detail the Turks' activity and the chaos that befell the Abbasid state and urban Iraq in the third quarter of the ninth century. These events fell somewhere between civil war and military uprising. Elsewhere, I have suggested that several factors were at play. Factional divisions, a fiscal crisis, um, one involving the military payroll in part, and a serious dip in the cohesion of the Turkish forces. And Tabari's account speaks in addition to deep resentments in the lower ranks over the wealth and privilege enjoyed by the Turkish leadership. Sort of Tabari of Square, really, is what's that word in a way. Uh, these are references, albeit scattered and uneven, to members of both groups of slaves subsequent to their arrival in Abbasid Iraq. Again, the question under consideration here concerns the achievement of elite standing on the part of some, albeit small number of individual singers and soldiers. The question concerns then, not only patterns of the two related histories, but the reception on the part of and interactions with the host society. In other words, there is a second approach that one might take it is to consider the position of both populations vis-a-vis -vis society at large. To begin with, it seems clear that neither group of slaves belonged. They were bereft, when they arrived in Iraq, they were bereft of social connections. That is, they were removed from their locations of origin and transported in some cases quite substantial distances, speaking both in cultural and geographical terms. They underwent what in many cases can only have been thorough deracination. That, uh, almost without exception, the first generation of both slave groups bore single unattached names, in other words, they were given single names, uh, makes altogether plain the extent of their diversity. <coughs> These were assigned names, designed to make the point of socioeconomic isolation obvious. I have referred previously to Ibn Butlan's text, uh, in which he refers to a variety of locales from which young female slaves were imported. But it bears stressing that there is little conclusive evidence regarding the related point on the extent to which one is dealing with individual versus groups of slaves. To what extent, in other words, were slaves arriving with kinsmen or others with whom they shared language, culture, background. To illustrate the point, the one reference to the acquisition of Bula the Elder, a key member of the Samad and Turkish military command, speaks not only to his capture, escape, and recapture, by two successive governors in Khorasan, uh, the province of eastern Iran, but also to his sons who were transported with him to Baghdad. There is also evidence that Tulun, the father of the well-known later governor of Egypt, Ahmed ibn Tulun, arrived in Abbasid Iraq with companions, possibly kinsmen. The two references go to the extent and nature of the deracination suffered by both populations. Um, the corollary, of course, is that the young slaves in both categories, whether individually or collectively, arrived in Abbasid Iraq without access to social contacts to replace those from which they had been separated. But again, the picture is muddy. The sources, for example, do refer to those Turks and the young women who were acquired within Iraq itself. There is little, uh, there's little in the evidence to suggest the nature or extent of, those, of their connections to uh, the host society. Um, similarly, for the singers, the evidence refers to girls sold within the Near East, having been born and reared by local families, notably in Basra. The social alienation of these women, then, is to be differentiated from that of the slave girls and women transported from, say, the Balkans, or Afghanistan, or the East African coast. And what manner of interaction occurred, if any, between the young slave women of local origin with their counterparts from the far-reaching region? In other words, what relationships did the young slaves enter into upon their arrival in urban Iraq? Was the principal relationship with the master, the slave owner, the slave merchant, the elite, the elite household? Or was that relationship mitigated by other circumstances? Um, this paper has not addressed the significant distinctions in the histories of the two groups. Again, I'm not, I'm not uh, underscoring those distinctions. But it is worth pointing out that the Turkish military was a professional force. We don't have a lot on its formal elements, the command structure, the system of ranks, organization, and all of these things. 
Um, but we can't presume that the recruits were assigned formal rank and, and rose up the rank in many, and rose up the ranks in many cases. These entailed then some manner of relationship with higher ups at ascending ranks uh, and then relationships with fellow soldiers. Alongside questions regarding social isolation and or cultural deracination are those regarding social stigma. Did slave origins and or standing matter to Near Eastern society at large? It seems that they matter a great deal. The indications are that one was tagged, so to speak. Uh, one bore the stigma of slavery through one's life. There is little room here to consider all of the evidence. Uh, reference can be made once again to Ibn Butlam's characterization and stratification of the slave women. There is also the important essay on slave singers by El Jahiz, a prominent 9th century Baghdadi uh, essayist. Poetry, frequently an important source of evidence on prevailing social patterns, offers evidence as well. The poems of El Mutanebi, who dies in 955, on his one time patron, Kafur, the regent of a short lived state of Egypt and a eunuch of unspecified African origins, uh, this poetry contains a series of demeaning references to the latter's slave origins and ethnic groups. So this is a poet writing for someone who's, who's risen quite far up the ranks, obviously. A similar mix of attitudes, that is, regarding ethnic origins, uh, humble background, legal standing, appear clearly to have surrounded the image of the Turk in Near Eastern society and imagination. Then there is the question of legal constraints, the law. The topic, like the others, is very complex. There is, first of all, the question of delineating in Islamic law the treatment of slavery and slaves in specifically the early Abbasid period. If, as specialists seem to agree, the ninth century witnessed significant developments in the Islamic legal tradition, um, uh, what did this mean then for the regulation of slavery? In broad terms, the fundamentals were in place. The Quran, the prophetic hadith, the traditions speak directly to many facets of slavery. Uh, whereby slaves were subject to a body of regulation underlying which was the view that while the slave was certainly property, he or she occupied a particular standing to which there was attached certain personal rights and religious duties. Uh, for example, the classical law stipulates that the umwalat, the slave woman who bears the child of her owner, enjoys three additional rights. She cannot be sold, she is to be free upon her master's death, and her offspring are born free. Note the overlap of gender and slavery as matters to be regulated. But there are questions surrounding Islamic slavery law. Particular problems, for example, surround recourse to the legal manuals and other related sources, such as biographical dictionaries. Also, at what point were the classical regulations governing the standing and rights of the slave firmly in place? What nature of access did slaves have to the courts or some other source of legal opinion and or protection? To what extent did society at large uh, and the imperial state in particular feel it necessary to abide by these regulations? In other words, were the elite paying attention to what the uh, lawyers were telling them? It does seem unlikely that we will come to any detailed understanding of slavery laws that played out on the ground. Uh, mention was made earlier of a set of passages in which the women singers complain of their handling as slaves. These are problematic on some various grounds, but at the very least, they suggest some manner of debate surrounding the one facet of Abbasid slave trade and its reception as society at large. So, looking at this sort of second chapter, the second phase, this uh, act two, uh, the, we have three patterns. Uh, we can look at sociocultural deracination, we can look at social and ethnic stigma, we can look at legal constraints. Uh, and again, each clearly requires further investigation. But the overall point is that members of both groups of slaves were obliged to negotiate a new and very difficult environment following their arrival uh, into urban households or the barracks of Samarra or the holding spaces of slave marketplaces. Um, they were, it seems entirely fair to say, without livelihood or wealth. They were often bereft of meaningful social connections and they were subject to all manner of obstacles, as just suggested.